Hello, Makers, and welcome to season two of the Irish Makers podcast. This season, we have incredible new makers, craftsmen, and builders to show you. But today, I want to introduce you to some of Ireland's best blade makers. We have two Sams, Sam Gleeson and Sam Dunn, both the best of the best when it comes to blade making. These guys have a long storied history in Ireland. They have produced some of the most incredible blades I have ever seen. I'm not going to go into a big detail all about them because I want you to hear them explain it themselves because they have a great story to tell. Let's just jump straight into it. Hey guys. Hey Nathan. Hey Sam. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing, lads? How are you getting on? Good, not bad at all. Right, lads. We're going to go with Sam Gleason there to my to my left, and then we got Sam Dunn yep. on the bottom. I was sitting here in pre-production, and I was thinking, I can't just be like, so Sam, tell me about this, and then there's the two of you is talking over each other. But anyway, listen, I want to jump straight into it. Uh, Sam Gleason, would you tell me how you got into blade making? Sam Dunn and I are going to have a similar starting point <laughs> of a very particular man in West Cork. Well, two particular men in West Cork, um, but it's nice that we can both cite them as probably forefathers and inspirations. So, uh, for me in particular, was Fingal Ferguson, uh, and in a long roundabout way, Rory O'Connor. And I guess you'll get Sam's story in a minute. But um, I would have been cooking in various circles. Uh, for a while when I first arrived in Ireland and my root circles all arrived by meeting Fingal and working with Fingal and cooking at fancy food events and having a bit of a laugh and he kind of nudged me gently into the workshop thinking that I might enjoy learning how to make a knife and we both realised very quickly that I did enjoy it and uh, he kind of steered me down a, a rabbit hole that I've been falling further and further down over a long period of time. So you started your career in food? I arrived in Ireland to help the guys build the Fumbly up in Dublin, and that's uh, Fingal's uh, sister-in-law is one of the owners there. And uh, just working with them before they built the Fumbly, we were doing festival food and messing around, uh, fancy food events and stuff like that, bit of dinners for Jameson, and uh, just kind of found myself around a fire with Fingal cooking lots and admiring his knives. And he just kind of gave me a gentle kick in the direction to start making them. So, so you just go from working in a restaurant to then picking up and then going straight to the RDS and then winning winning a, a, a best in not, show not award. Quite as far as... That, but, uh, we had a myself and uh, Fingal's brother-in-law had a furniture making business um, in Dublin. So I was pottering away with the knives and then uh, chefing Monday to Friday and making furniture sort of in the evenings and at the weekends. And slowly the furniture making business took off and my chefing ended up being a Saturday job just to get me out meeting people um, out of the workshop where myself and Barry had just been pulled up, working away for the week. And then uh, the knives just slowly, slowly took off, worked our way through, and the, the furniture pieces kind of were ticking away. And my interest in the knives was building more and more. The food bits now, I tend to dive in and out of the food as and when I can. My wife's a really good chef. We had a little restaurant together. So we get to play with some nice food events still. And the furniture nowadays, I I rarely dive down the furniture rabbit hole. I kind of cherry pick very carefully what I want to make for people. So if I get a really nice commission come up that I'm very interested in, I do it. Otherwise, it's just knives or looking after kids. I, uh, generally looking after kids, <laughs> trying to make knives instead of looking <laughs> after kids. Uh, Dunn, let's jump over to you. So. Tell us how you got into the whole kind of blade making world. Yeah, so I suppose I've always been a maker. You know, I've always, I was kind of brought up that way to be tinkering with bits and pieces, whether it be cars or welding or it was always generally metal related. I did well in school with the kind of the crafts, you know, woodwork, metal work, the technical subjects like that. I suppose like, you know, I was working cleaning windows, power washing, 
soft wash and all that kind of stuff. Every year around Christmas time, from like Christmas Day onwards, it's dead for like three weeks. Just there's no work. Everybody's, you know, busy with family. There's no money around if everything's spent. So there's no there's no work for people like me cleaning. And uh, the first week's nice, but then after that, it's cabin fever time. And uh, I wasn't going to have another year of it. I was like, no, I'm going to do something different this Christmas. Something where I learned something, a new skill. So I had met Rory a couple of times in the past. I thought, you know what, I'll try and make a knife. I've, I've seen a couple of videos on YouTube. and I made this little bushcraft knife. And uh, I thought the next logical step would be to take it to Rory, see what he thought of it. And, you know, he asked me questions, a couple of technical questions about the, the making. He kind of assumed that I hadn't um, hardened the knife, which is one of the processes which I had. And, like, he was like, oh, gee, because he's, he's actually done the business on this knife. So it was kind of, uh, he was taken aback, you know. And then I suppose I took my next, my next 30 knives over the next couple of years to him just to show him what I was up to, struck up a bit of a friendship with him. And at the same time, I bought a couple of bits and pieces off Fingal and uh, struck up a friendship with him too. So, um, yeah, those two boys would have given me my real start, but I suppose I also owe a lot to the, the multitude of, of teachers in YouTube and Instagram. And, you know, you, you learn so much in this high technology era, don't you? Uh, yeah, it, it seems like start. Rory and Finger are really instrumental in both of you coming to the kind of the knife making yeah. world. Were they big in the kind of blade making scene before you guys came along? Well, I suppose like Rory um, would be real old school. You know, he 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 was making knives and selling knives all over the country and internationally before the internet age. Um, I don't yeah, know probably how he did it. I don't know how he did it. So, so he's been making knives for forty years. Yeah, Fingal would Fingal is like the mad scientist amongst us. He's uh, the experimenter. So, you know, I, I feel like not that I have not that I'm competing with Fingal, but I feel like I'm permanently chasing Fingal's heels in the nicest possible way. He's inspirational to me. So he's kind of like the uh, the pace setter in a in a in a three thousand meter race or something, you know? He's just flat out and you're just trying to catch him. That's him for me. <laughs> What about you, I Lisa? find him like a, a Willy Wonka type character, yeah. in that you don't quite know what he's up to or what he's doing, and every time you see him, just when, like you think you've got like a you've got your own work going on, you've got a few questions maybe you want to pick his brain about, and all of a sudden he's like, "Hey, I've I've done this route. Have you thought about this?" And you're like, "No, I have never even <laughs> that's not even crossed my mind. Like, how have you ended up there?" And he's as excited about it as he is from the first day that he started doing it. It's really nice watching that excitement, I think. I guess for me, the uninitiated. So I know very little about knife making. But what I do know about is watching a hell of an awful lot of YouTube and Instagram reels. And every second person I seem to see on Instagram and TikTok now, it's like I'm making knives. And it's like such a big thing. You had like Forged in Fire over in the States. You've kind of had all these TikTok videos and YouTube, and it just seems to have exploded. And everyone seems to be at it in some sort of way. Like we were looking for different people to come on the show, and there was like 30, 40, 50 blade makers in Ireland. Surely it wasn't like this 10, 15 years ago. Like, is it just as a new phenomenon that people are getting into blade making? Yeah, I think even like five years ago was a very, or probably even four years ago, maybe even three, like, uh, Probably the year before COVID, there were a few people starting to tinker around with a few bits and bobs. And I guess everybody in COVID realized they had more time on their hands and they could dive into the garage or the workshop and get their hands on a few bits before Brexit went mental. And um, they managed to get hold of all sorts of goodies to start playing with. And uh, it just took off from there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I also think there's been a little bit of a mindset change with people. I think there's a little bit of a renaissance for handmade i think people's appreciation levels have gone up a little bit rather than being the consumerism you know just buying stuff with a view to having it for three or four years been next i think people are kind of thinking longer term where they're thinking no if i buy a decent whatever let's say a knife i could pass that on to my kids if i look after that and um, because it's well made somebody's actually devoted their life to learning the skills involved in actually making it well rather than making it 
quick or cheap. I, I think that's actually come into sharp focus the last couple of years where people have kind of clicked over to a different frequency with that. That makes sense. Is that like a thing of, you know, I'm seeing this as well. We're talking to different makers. People are looking for custom made goods uh, that are personal to them as opposed to generic yeah. something I rip off Amazon. Yeah. Yeah. And I also yeah. think that, like, you know, especially with the, um, again, with the social media, I, I, I'm a firm believer that people who are buying, let's say, a knife from me or buy a knife from Mr. Gleason over there, um, they're actually buying into that person and they're buying into that person's character. They feel like they've got to know each of us individually through our social medias, whereas you wouldn't have had that before. So, like, you wouldn't have even thought maybe of buying something from Sam or myself. Because you didn't, there was no social media. We couldn't make that connection with um, thousands of people, which we can make now, and you know, a fingerprint click, and that's it. Even the change from like Rory is a great example of that because like, Rory has existed for a very long time before social media, and has kind of managed to do his work and still have a huge list of people that want to buy his work and people found him and it, it's only recently that he's got onto social media people managed to do this before all social media has allowed a wider circle of people to do this and watching like sam dunn is very good at sharing how he does his work and educating people he's one of the first people like if anyone's got any questions he is your man to go and talk to. Like he's really good at explaining stuff. He's really good at putting videos up, talking through process, um, and having that access to things is fantastic. Whereas probably for you and I, Sam, when we were starting, we were very lucky to have people like Rory and Fingal. It was only really just starting on the internet that you got videos and now we're able like we can talk to anybody in the world yeah. about something that we might be stuck on or wanting to explore and it it's a nice open community in that you could pick somebody's brains who has made five knives and when you've made one and they're going to be able to tell you what they learned from their five knives or you can pick somebody's brain that's made five thousand knives and they're going to be open to telling you about what they know um, it's not a closed space. People want to share information and want to help each other out. Yeah, I actually so, think I've only come across one maker or maybe two who I asked them a question and they, they wouldn't tell me. So that like, and I've asked hundreds of questions. So like, <laughs> that really speaks to the generosity of the community um, because it is like that. It's very much like that. You ask people who are kind of, you know, in quotation marks, leagues ahead of you. And they'd have time for you, like most of them. So it's, it's really nice just to have that access to information as well. So is that like one of these kind of like, is there a sense of trade secrets or something in knife making? Or was that just one person really, who was like, I'm not sharing what I'm doing. I'm not answering your questions. No, no, no. There, there really isn't. But I suppose the one or two people that I asked those questions to felt there was. But, but in general, there isn't. People would be very open. I suppose, you know, people wouldn't really want you um, ripping them off or whatever, but by and large, it's a very uh, generous community. It's lovely, really nice. But that's good. That's what you want. Like, mm. like for all the different maker communities, what you want is for people to get on well and to be sharing and to be kind of fostering that sense of growing the, you know, some people it's a hobby, for other people it's a profession. But if you don't have that kind of open and interested community, you just end up with a, a bunch of people, a couple of people at the top and then very few people coming up in the ranks. Mm. Um, and I've seen yeah. that in other communities and it's it, it's super toxic uh, because it's just kind of like I've got mine, you know. Tell me, yeah. how does one rip off a knife maker? Do you uh, guys have your own signature styles? Elements. Uh, elements. I'd say you and I do by now. People know our work, don't they? So they know what we yeah. like making yeah. and what we do. Um, Fingal yeah. has his handle. Rory has his style. Like, the more you do, you kind of hopefully find things that you like doing and how you work and people should be able to recognize your work um, given what you make things out of or how you put things together. Do you have one on hand there to show us? Mm, go on, Sam, bag full there, I bet. Um, I, have, I, I put a few out here just oh. because I knew it was going to be short. But like, yeah, just um, 
I suppose that the shape of handle would be my style. Uh, yeah, yeah. Try and do maybe mine is more my steel. Is lovely, yeah. lovely and kind of. Uh, hey, can you get? Uh, does that work? Um, I see. I'm really That's into gorgeous. making my steel. Basically, I'm messing around with random bits of shit to stick together to make something. So, Dun, you you clearly have that that clear like uh, angled style, and then is that like through all your knives? Yeah, everyone, yeah. And Except then if you maybe... go for that kind of unpolished look, the kind of the more, oh, you probably have a better word for it than I would. They'd be the only ones that would be a bit different, hidden tangles. Yeah, just a, a, an ongoing theme, I suppose. We've both got our own ongoing themes. He's, um, mine's all angles. He's more uh, laminated steels and and a full story, because like ev every aspect of Sam Gleason's in the um <laughs> kind of a, a decent story a genuine story behind it. it's not spin it's real um salvage yeah. from all sorts of life very nice what's this, going on there so this is raw material for me basically um this is half a anchor chain loop dug out of the shannon estuary it's sat there for about a hundred years i don't know how old I, it would be great to carbon date it but this is really good pure raw iron from a, a ship that obviously sunk down in the Shannon. Um, I like to use that when I'm laminating steels and that gives you, if you see the textures in here, yeah, right, that way, um, the top layer is the raw iron and the darker layer is the high carbon steel that we use for the cutting edge. So I like to make bits of steel basically sandwich is what it is inside this is the really good high quality carbon steel as the filling of the sandwich and on the outside is things like the anchor chain it could be whiskey barrel straps it could be a uh, horse drawn cartwheel rim all sorts of random stuff if i can stick it together then it will go into a knife um sometimes it spectacularly fails and it's upsetting but other times it's good. And then the it's wood like for me. Delaminate. Yeah. And sometimes really well. <laughs> so you think you've got it and all of a sudden it's just pinging off down the room. Other times you think you've got it and you get all the way. So like once it's forged, these are like some rough forgings at the minute. And this is kind of where I'm getting to on my shapes before it's refined. Um, once they're there. They are coming to a clean up and a, a grind, and you can see a bit more. Um, so oh, yeah. I'm trying to get as close as possible to that shape, smashing it all together. And then the wood for me is generally lumps of stuff like this. So it's a storm felled limb off of a tree. I'm very lucky to have some friends down at Ballymaloo. And um, they have some amazing trees down on site there. And whenever there's a storm in the winter, I get a phone call telling me there's an oak tree falling down or a beech tree falling down. And we're very lucky where we live. We've got uh, some really beautiful old apple trees and ash trees and stuff. So when the storms hit and bits and bobs of trees fall down, I tend to harvest them or break them up, dry them out, um, stabilize them. And then that's what goes into my handles. So... There's a nice story of where the timber comes from and a nice story of where the steel comes from. That's amazing. Like, I, I've heard of people recycling fallen trees. I know wood turners, the wood turners are yeah. based around Dublin. They have a WhatsApp group. I'll be hitting them up for bits of wood. Yeah, they I, I think want they it. call it like Tree Watch or something. Okay. And they've got like about 50 of these wood turners, and then they're all around uh, Dublin and uh, kind of the East Coast. And any time a tree goes down, they're all just there like, there's a tree yeah. down. And then they're all just kind of descend on it with chainsaws and top of this tree. Somebody I don't think ESP has had to put that out oh, oh, a tree oh. in years. <laughs> These lads just come out with chainsaws. And they're just like, oh, it's a great tree. And they chop it up and off they go. It's incredible that you've got such a great story for your steel. I mean, like, to me anyway, that's worth so much more than a generic item you can get that comes off, obviously, I don't know, billeted, billeted steel or sheet steel. Um, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's it's so much more, and I'd be I'd be willing to spend so much more money just because it comes with the cracking story. 
Uh, what would you uh, done? Do you use kind of like sheet steel or kind of what do you kind of steel you're using or like? Metal? Yeah, I, I I do use a lot more from sheet steel. Um, it just it it just um suits me better because you know Mr. Gleason's all metal mash and mayhem, whereas for me, I haven't got the space for it, and it, it, you know it doesn't even appeal to me as much. I I respect every aspect of the craft, and um, you know I I probably know a lot of the theory as regards the actual hands on tools. And that the skills, I wouldn't have them. I do. I buy my stuff in in sheets, and I go from there. You know, I suppose beyond beyond cut, you know, having the shape, every process from there on would be very similar to processes that Sam would be employing. But you're just starting from a different point. Yeah, and and I think like you know, I, I, I make a lot of knives nowadays from stainless steels, which stainless steels can be forged, but it's kind of uncommon, really. I make a lot of knives from stainless steel because I like the idea of my knives looking kind of as good as they look when they leave my workshop as they will look in five years' time, ten years' time. I kind of like that idea. Whereas, like, with a more high-carbon route, if it goes into the wrong household, things can kind of descend into a little bit more... Uh, but, um, so, but the- yeah, so that's the, that's the trade-off. That is the trade-off it's, there is no best way of going about knife making. It's that's the beauty of it too. Actually, it's it's your way. So, uh, and in your what appeals to me. Exactly. So, like, what appeals to me and what I feel is the best way for me would probably be Sam Gleason's worst nightmare in a lot of ways. But that there's, there's kind of room for everyone, which is great. Like you know, um, and there's a mutual respect, which is nice too. So yeah, that's the story. I, I wasn't actually thinking of you, Sam, when I was in the states and. Um, I was making this, which is uh, called an integral knife, and it's basically a, a big lump of steel that you squish down and grind. But to grind it, I normally only grind like the very bottom of my blades. I try and forge them as close as possible, and it's just the last bit. And suddenly, I had to do a, a full knife grind, and I, I couldn't actually remember when I last ground a. A full knife. I was like, "Damn, I'm gonna have to phone Sam and try and remember what I'm up to." And the nerves on the grinder were like, "Okay, don't slip. Keep, keep focus. Keep doing." Yeah. I think, like what you do, there's aspects of that that I find incredibly difficult because it's not something I do all the time. No, and I'm sure if I was to get you in the forge and say, "Okay, just do this," like you get you'll get it, yeah. but like you ain't gonna be doing it first time, kind of thing. No. No, you wouldn't. You like after fifty goes, I might have something half decent, but it's just it's horses for courses. We're on very we're on very different courses, and you know what? It works. Like you know, even there's there's a crossover too. Like we've got Sam Gleason's got a really lovely project coming up. Um, not a project. It's it's going to be a, a change of whole approach with his new school knife making school, which he's going to explain a lot better than me. But I've started so I'll finish, and part of the whole crowdfunded for it is going to be collaboration efforts uh, making little knives yeah I, i've been blessed by being picked to make two little knives he's made the blades in his forge all the uh, metal mashing and uh, he sent me these lovely little blades that i've got to handle in my style now and uh, finish out and you know it, it goes towards the actual crowdfunder and like there's some really great names alongside me with finishing out little blades so yeah, there's, even though we're so different, we really are opposite ends of the spectrum in a lot of ways, but we're sort of uh, singing from the same hymn sheet too. I want to I want to come back to that workshop piece, Sam. I, I do want to come back to that, but I want to just ask a few questions just on the actual art of blade, um, because otherwise we're going to go down a hole, and I'm excited to go down that hole, but I want to kind of clarify a few things first. So explain to me like I'm five, because I actually have no idea, and I imagine an awful lot of our listeners really don't get the difference between stainless steel, steel, high carbon steel, full tang, um, or, or any of this kind of stuff. So, like, if you were to explain it like I'm an idiot, how do you go about creating a blade? Complicated question that I'm looking for an easy answer for. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, like, you know, there's a couple of things that are common uh, through every blade, whatever it's, whether it's, you know, stainless steel, high carbon steel, San Mai, Damascus, whatever it is, there's going to be a basic shape, time-tested uh, shape. There's definitely going to be heat treatment involved. 
which involves taking steel from being something that's relatively malleable and uh, shapeable into something that's very hard, as hard as that steel can be made. Um, there's going to be tempering involved. There's probably going to be drilling holes involved. There's going to be copy drilling handle scales involved. There's going to be a little bit of woodwork and shaping handles into something that's ergonomic. There's going to be blade grinding down to a very fine, uh, keen edge. There's going to be sharpening involved. So, like, I mean, obviously, there's there's also an overall aesthetic which works through the whole piece. So that's common. I would say that's a common skeleton that's with every single knife. But that's it is a broad question. <laughs> <laughs> and what you mentioned a couple of different types of steel there. So, like, what do what does that actually mean? It's Sam Gleason. Gleason's the man. He can tell you. Yeah, for me, I think like for Sam and I, the main element that combines our work is the carbon in the steel. Without the carbon, you ain't making a knife. Like whether it's stainless or uh, a non-stainless steel, it's that carbon content that allows you to harden it. And then it's other bits and pieces in it that will change the properties of that steel. So with um, when we're making the pattern welded steel, you can see different color. I have to work out this. So different colors in here are two different color, two different types of steel that we're laminating together and you can acid etch them. Both have carbon in them. So I've stuck that all together and that's going to work on a heat treat and a temper and a grind. I know I can work all through that. Whereas the layered steels that we do when we're doing the sandwich, the, the filling of the sandwich is what we're really concerned about. And that's the important bit. I buy my carbon steels uh, the same as Sam is buying cheap material. I know exactly what's in that steel. I can heat treat to one degree and temper to one degree to get the best possible results of hardness and edge retention and stuff like that. The bits that I chuck in, like the anchor chain and all the other stuff, it doesn't really matter. Like it, Some things stick easier than other things, but they're, they're a nice bit of the story. But the, the essence is that filling of the sandwich. That's the, that's the key to it all. And I really it's like making sandwiches. Uh, you, you're folding in different ways, so it could be, uh, let's say that's for the easiest possible way. I've squished down this big chunk of steel into some very skinny bits of steel, and then I will get my high carbon steel, and it will go in as the sandwich. You weld it all up, you put it in the forge, smash it out. That's your sandwich once it's all squished down. Um, you can go crazy on the like people somebody made a million layer damascus i think at some point i'm not entirely sure why because it was probably so many layers it probably just looked like a piece of plain steel anyway but the more layers you add in the more complicated your pattern if you're trying to make the sam mize then i tend to favor i want a nice thick core and then the pattern for me can be a play around. It could be very low layer. It could be singular materials. It might just be something I fancy doing. I don't know if you can see on. He's got a bit of tricks one. there. This is, uh, yeah, just messing. This is all the bit. Basically, is that, I was is very that lucky to win the RDF award. So this is called Edge Bar Damascus. So this is a slightly different way of doing things in that you make um, almost pencil sized pieces of Damascus in squares, stack them all on top of each other and then weld them up and squish them out. The other thing that we were doing as well, which this is like beyond my brain really, this is mosaic tile Damascus. Um, push that back a tiny bit that's like a see that. pattern how is that done how how on earth yeah so this is this is the culmination of two weeks work basically is about three kilos of steel produce four blades that i haven't finished yet and you are manipulating different 
layers of steel. So um, mosaic pattern Damascus is using the concept of basically creating a stick of rock. So instead of when you when you make the sandwich normally, your pattern is just on either side of the blade. When you make mosaic tiles, you're making a big chunk of steel and the pattern runs down through the steel like a when you get a stick of rock and it says the place yeah. where the rock's from. So then when you cut that stick of rock, you've got repeat tile again, 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 and you can lay those tiles next to each other and you can build out a blade. And then you have to weld all that together and stick it. So each of these little repeat patterns, uh, there you go, is one tile. So if you can see, let's try and get that in the light. That to there is about one tile. Uh, and it's been stretched out on the power hammer. So when it started, it was about that sort of size and I've grown it and stretched it. Now, the guy that is teaching this, it like his brain of how he engineers this is astronomical. He, he kind of explained to him the end point of what you want your pattern. And it's, I don't know, he's, he's out on a different stratosphere somewhere, but he's able to reverse engineer whatever you want to build and comes right back to, okay, your initial stack is seven pieces of this steel, three pieces of that steel, two pieces of that, dun, 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 dun. And then you're going to do this. And he just watches through this. And it, it was amazing to, to see how you can create from an end point right back. Very, very, very inspiring. Very different from how I normally work. If you can see the thickness on this it's probably five or six mil with the bolster as well um there's a lot of steel in there it, it still weighs a lot this does whereas my forgings that's a similar size blade this is probably five mil here down to one and a half mil here um and the same along here it's probably one and a half mil along this edge that's as as I want to get before heat treat and I'll only be grinding a small amount of this off whereas these blades you're grinding loads and loads of material down and as you grind it away the pattern emerges more and more and more and it gets more complex it All sounds right, like really next level <laughs> like, yeah. like, like um, that's master level work you could disappear down a rabbit hole of just making patterns and possibly even never make a knife again you could just end up making steel with pattern in it and be probably content that you just created like the craziest pattern in the world okay so if you have these incredible patterns and then you have all the different types of steel then how do you marry that up with handles because i've talked to a couple of other knife makers and they seem to have a million different types of materials to make handles and it all seems to be very very custom so where is most of the artistry in the blade or is it in the handle for me there's total combination of both i think i one of the things i love about the knife making is it allows you to explore design um industrial process woodwork metalwork there's there's so many different elements of it so like even just like what I picked out this evening to go through. I've got laburnum that came from a friend of mine's garden that got chopped down. I've got Irish walnuts that came from a Winfield tree in East Cork. There is a piece of oak from Ballymaloo. There's a piece of bog oak from a local beach washed up next to me. There's some Irish witch elm from a tree that came down in Clare. There is a bit of magnolia, which is a very traditional um, wood used in Japanese knives that this was actually growing in the Glynn estate in Limerick. So another bit of bog oak that came, I think Fingal got this out of a bog somewhere near him. Or so. so like you could go forever and be digging up bits of wood or picking up bits of wood off the side of the road, or you can go and buy some, and make, like some of the wood that Sam gets is astronomical. It's like, People have stabilized it, Sam's stabilizing stuff. 
mad patterns in it. Yeah, yeah it, it is like that. So you're kind of always, you're like a magpie, you know, you're always on the lookout for new materials, new opportunities to get a relationship going with people who are new suppliers and bits and pieces. So like you, you can, like Sam was saying, you can go with uh, natural timbers or you can pick, you know, natural timbers like this, which is, it's a Corellian birch, uh, oh, wow. English grown, I think. But then somebody has actually sucked pink dye into it and a resin and set that resin and dyed it. And that'll stay that color forever now, you know, whereas it kind of started out life as a blonde, blondy colored timber. Um, and yet yeah, you can you can manipulate things that way. Same with this one. This was double dyed. So like blue, green. And then this section here is the natural color. So, um, yeah, just you can you can play around with all sorts. And then like I try and buy woods from kind of all over the world if I can. So I buy a lot of desert iron wood, which is from Arizona. Very uh, inhospitable climate. Produces lovely timber. And then uh, sort of quilted maple from the States. I really like this one as well. This is a, kind of a new timber to me. I've used a couple of times. It looks very bad on video, but uh, in real life, it's it's really lovely. It's Yaren from Australia. So, yeah. But then you've also got like synthetics, you know, like Sam Gleason might not use many synthetics, but I'd, I'd use a couple of synthetic materials. This one was made in Germany and it looks like a blue uh, snake skin. That looks phenomenal. That? It really, really looks yeah. phenomenal. It's, it's kind of like a more like a uh, carbon fiber kind of look to it. Yeah. And uh, I suppose like, you know, that, that engages me where I think like that, I find the materials interesting and, um, I kind of like the idea that these knives are going into houses all over the country, all over Europe, all over the world. And um, hopefully, you know, they're, they're sitting on maybe knife magnets and people are, are thinking like they're seeing things which are very different to what they've seen, you know, rather than just like a, a knife from Ikea. They're seeing a chef knife, which is like, where did you buy that? And like, you know, they didn't, they didn't buy it from a shop. And it's like, oh, this was made by a fella in... Lengareth in Ireland, this made made by a fellow in, you know, County Clare and a Styman. Um, and there's a little bit of a story behind it, and it's it's it started the conversation because it's a talking piece. Um, and I like to think, at least, hopefully, that you know we're 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 making works that are going out into the world, which can actually be a talking piece, actually actually be something to uh, chew the cud on for a minute, rather than. Just to throw away society kind of a, a product triggering. I think the right that's way. a really <laughs> big thing these days in terms of the different uh, crafts people we've spoken to. The amount of them that are selling a story and they're selling uh, bespoke, unique pieces that people are just like, that's so incredible because we live in a, such a society that everything is just mass produced. It comes out of factories. The person next to you is wearing the same clothes as you. They have the same phone as you. You know, we, we, we think of ourselves as individuals. But if we look around our homes, uh, yeah. how much of what we actually have in them is unique to us that didn't come out of a, a factory? And I think if for a lot of people, uh, that's probably 100% of the things have come out of a factory. They're carbon copies. You might have organized them in a slightly different way but there's nothing unique about anything that an awful lot of people own. And I think that's, that's a bit crazy. And it kind of goes against the whole idea of having art in our lives that we need a little bit of uniqueness. And I guess for you guys, that's the blade making. It's bringing a piece of art in that form, which is incredible. Like, tell me who's buying your knives. Like are most of your knives chef knives or do you make any other type of knives? Pretty much all chef's knives and they're selling from professional chefs to home cooks. Sam, I'm guessing you're probably the same as well. Yeah, mine would be very similar. I, I would stick almost exclusively to chef knives. Now and again, I'll do a hunter for somebody that I know, but I kind of stay away from it because um, that's actually another rabbit hole. You'd be you'd be quick getting it wrong. Uh, I, I just go into chef making mode. Yeah, so I, all chef knives and they'd be going to a lot of foodies, people who are into food. People are into eating out, into hitting the new restaurants, hitting the re restaurants 
heading for Michelin stars and pushing, they'd be the people who'd be buying my knives. The people who frequent those businesses would be frequenting myself and Sam Gleason's doors too. I think that's a really interesting point to like the the explosion of the Irish food scene has really seen possibly why we have an explosion in knife making and as Irish produce has got an awful accessibility to Irish produce has got better the quality of Irish restaurants has got better the the quality of Irish chefs have got better um events and where people can act, like where average joe can go and access either in a food event or a restaurant or a michelin star event people are more comfortable with spending money on food and feeling that they want quality out of that and maybe in the past so the push of the tv programs was like the home renovation kind of thing and then the garden renovation program came and then there was the whole cooking scene and yeah. cookery programs. And at the back of that, we've been really lucky. People possibly made their homes better and they made the gardens better. Then they learned to cook and they were like, oh, hang on a minute. Not only have I renovated my lounge and made, or an extension on the house and now I've made the garden nice and now I've learned to make a really nice curry or whatever, but I can actually have a really nice chopping board and a nice knife. And it's yeah. There's a a belief in the quality of all of those aspects that people have managed to put in now. I actually reckon there's also a, a factor of it being one of the most overlooked and often used tools in the home. You know, you you spoke earlier, Nathan, about maybe you've got the same phone as people, you've got the same, you know, coat, boots, this, that. Now, if you buy a pair of boots, right, they cost you 20 quid, brand new, the chances are they're going to be garbage, to be honest with you. They, they will, like. Whereas if you buy a pair of bag house, you know, something like that, something that's going to cost you maybe two, three hundred, they, they, they'd last you for 10, 12, 15 years, if you mind them. Same with the coat. Same, like, maybe the phone would be a bad example because they're a very highly turned over item. But, you know, if, even if you buy a really cheap phone, it will do the same job as your smartphones and stuff, but you're going to get a different level of performance. And it is the same with the knives. And it, it's almost like a, an X factor, you know, you, where you can't put your finger on. Because, like, you know, you buy a cheap knife, it's going to cut up your veg prep, it's going to cut up your meats, and you're going to cook your meal, you're going to eat your meal, it's going to be bing, bang, bosh, done. You buy a decent knife, it's going to do the same things for you. But it's the X factor's there where it's like, I actually can't wait to prep for tomorrow. And, like, how often have you heard, Sam Gleason, um, somebody say, there's no more fruit and veg left in the house. It's all chopped up. Yeah. yeah. Knife. <laughs> it's, it, honestly, never. you hear it all the time. It's oh, all man. chopped. It's all, it, it's all diced. It's all <laughs> everything in the fridge. Because, like, there's a different quality to it. Like, oh, my goodness. What have I been doing? With my 32 years on this air with these bad knives, and you have a decent one, it's it's revolutionised the way that you think about cooking. It does like. I, I come in if I'm messing around with a, a new shape or edge geometry, and uh, depending on what Neve and I are deciding to cook for the night, and I'll like sneak into the house with a half finished knife and be like, okay, what what are we having for dinner tonight? What did what should we chop? And just be like, okay. Da -da 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 -da. Or she'll suddenly come in and she's like, okay, who chopped all the onions? Like, <laughs> what's, <laughs> where we, what's going on? It's a very objective observation that people enjoy them so much because they've been using very poor tools for many years. And then once Isn't you have that, decent... I can well boots, believe that. I own boots. crap knives. I own a lot <laughs> of crap knives. <laughs> Most people do own a crap knife. And like when you go on holiday, it was always the thing of like, oh God, we're going to the the Airbnb or whatever, and they're going to have horrendous knives. And all of a sudden, we've suddenly started working out what a good knife is, and that it can be sharp and sharpenable as well. And that's a really strong point to raise for both of us. Is when you buy a knife off myself or Sam, we have got it to the best possible state that we can get it into. So it's going to be a really good tool for you to use, but you're going to go away and it will get blunt at some point, 
but we've designed it and worked with it that you're going to be able to sharpen it and it's going to last you more than your lifetime if you look after it and you learn how to look after it and you learn how to sharpen it whereas when you buy a knife from ikea somebody in an office went okay we're going to get it really really hard and the machine is going to profile this and they're going to get this sharp but like we don't need to worry about it when it gets blunt because they're going to throw it away and then in two years time or a year's time we'll bring out a different color and then they'll buy another one and another one and another one and another one you're absolutely right though because it's not a thing maintenance is not something that we understand anymore in modern life like if you take leather goods I, I've talked to so many people about leather goods and they're like, oh, I got these. They're nice, but they're a bit worn. I'll get rid of them. And it's like leather is like one of those things that if you just give it a condition and you condition yeah. your leather, uh, it'll come right back. But how many people actually know what leather conditioner actually is? How many people own products that actually could be conditioned with leather? Because we were yeah. so used to pleather with the whole kind of greenwashing that pleather mm. was a great mm. idea. And then we realized that we took an actual renewable resource, which is leather, and we replaced it with oil. <laughs> and we thought, we're great. Yeah. What but, are you doing? We never think about actually how to maintain things. I, I found that, and especially with knives, because I only recently got stones, and I'm absolutely brutal with the stones. But once I'd actually sharpened them, or half ass sharpened them, uh, I was like, oh my God, these are amazing. Like, it's so, so good. But it's one of those things that it's never really taught how to maintain good quality yeah. goods. And we're also not really, I think an awful lot of people don't consider what good quality goods actually mean and why you should spend more on something that lasts you 20 years. It's just not something that people do these days. People are so much into kind of, we were talking to a a furniture restorer a few episodes ago and she was like, uh, it's all about fast furniture. We've got fast fashion. Now we've got fast furniture and it's just, we bring in the new thing and we just replace the old and we don't think about anything long term. And it's such a terrible point where we are as a society that we're just like, chuck it away. You know, like we, we never think of getting something of great quality, which is amazing that you guys are having a knife that can, as you said, Gleason, can last your entire life. Like, like that must right. be amazing for you to think about that. My ground in inspiration, um, I studied environmental chemistry at university and one of my key people that I was really into their lectures uh, taught an environmental ethics class and William Morris was his hero. And I'd been aware of William Morris's work up until that point, but not really sort of the whole arts and crafts movement. And then the more I dived into that, I was like, hang on a minute, this is a group of people that were trying to like, steer the world away from the industrial revolution or at least wake people up to the problems of the industrial revolution and like we're 200 years later or wherever we are and we're still god knows what william morris would be doing at the minute he'd probably have an iphone and would probably be doing great things but he would be making some damn amazing stuff and pulling his hair out about the state of the world as well and i would like to think that people like myself Mm -hmm. and fingal and rory are doing our part to try and bring back a bit of real substance to what people are doing in the world and doing our little bit to cut down on crazy purchase general, which seems to be... <laughs> I think a lot another, of the- another hidden, hidden trade-off as well with the consumerism side of things is um, the loss of a sense of satisfaction. You mentioned there about leather boots, right? You've got these nice leather boots, two years of zero maintenance, they start to go to the dogs. Instead of bidding them, right, and buying a new pair, you actually look up a YouTube tutorial, you get on Amazon, you buy a couple of bits to actually balm them up and bring them back and suckle them up. I guarantee you, you'll be telling a couple of people about what you've done. It's the same with the knives. We're encouraging people to learn how to sharp. Like you've done there, you've bought a couple of stones, buy a couple of stones. You don't need much couple of stones and our leather belt to strop it and you're away and you've actually given people a little bit of inspiration to first and foremost look after their stuff but you've actually given them an opportunity to get a sense of satisfaction that's going it's it's almost gone back again just like bringing boots back just like bringing an edge back on the night you're buzzing afterwards like you know what i've actually i can nearly pat myself on the back for that because i've learned a new skill 
my knife cuts better again. And it's 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 an enthusiasm. It's a new skill. It's a new thing to talk about, rather than just the sort of trivial stuff all the time. Do you know, it's I learned a new thing of the week. I watched a couple of YouTube tutorials. I bought some stones, and all my knives are hair popping sharp. It took me ages. Eventually, I actually learned the whole game. And like, bring yours round next weekend, and we'll do them. Do you know, it it becomes a a much bigger thing than just upskilling it's, it's actually a, more of a social thing and i think it's it's very rewarding it's very um, satisfying i absolutely agree with you it's just one of those things that we really need to see a bit more of in our society i think the way you're describing it is actually phenomenal i think it's a really really great way that you're describing it like that sense of accomplishment that you have when you've yeah. you know you've yeah. brought something back or maintained that. something like we don't even maintain our cars anymore like, like that's no long like not even in my time but like maybe me, me, me grandfather's time your dad would be under the bonnet, setting the valve timing, you know, cleaning up dizzy caps and like, you know, a little bit of rub of a sandpaper on the on the distributor. And like people wouldn't even know what a dizzy cap is. <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. And, and, it, and it's, it's a shame. It's a shame. My old man made bits for vintage car engines. And at the age of 15, we had a, a Morris Minor as a family car. And when my yes. folks wanted to buy a new car, the deal was if I paid for the Morris Minor to go through the DOE, that it that could be my first car. But my dad met after it had done all its bits and bobs. My dad made me take the engine out of the car and rebuild the engine with him. And so by the time I was 17, I it wasn't something I was particularly enamored by what I, I really liked that he made stuff for all these old cars. I wasn't particularly interested in car aspect but i i knew when i was driving around that car and it stopped working i could generally yeah. find the problem why it stopped working and stick it back together or like the wing fell off and i managed to fiberglass the wing back on or the exhaust was falling off or i i knew enough to keep it running till it was long dead and gone kind of thing and like people there's kids around here Nurses is where it sounds like an old man but <laughs> there's there's 17 18 year old kids driving around here with like a 2018 parents yeah. bought them like i can't even afford to buy a 2018 i've got a 2000 skoda that we keep running i'm like how are they even running this vehicle it's like nobody knows how to to work on this vehicle that it's probably just sent to the mechanic now and again. They probably can't change a tire. Like we're we're losing all these skills. I, I think like That's as much as as much as this this has kind of gone down a, a path where we do sound like two old men. The point being, <laughs> it's, it's actually it's actually like very rewarding to get back to the old style of maintaining things, learning how to do things. I suppose, like, if, if there's anything that I encourage people to do, it's have a go. You know, work on watching a couple of videos, take a couple of notes, have a crack, learn from the failures and embrace the failures. Enjoy the failures. Because, like, oh, yeah, I can see where I went wrong. I'll tell you what, that's, that's the school of hard knocks. Like, you know, oh, somebody said to me years ago, that. failures, you, you, you're not to I look at failures as, as a failure. Look at them as tuition fees. And um, my, my tuition in knife making is almost free but i paid serious tuition fees along the way <laughs> massive because it's it's a blow to your confidence like ah oh, i'm not that's it i'm not doing it anymore Get out. that's what it's all about it's all about taking those knocks like anyone who starts anything yeah. i think an awful lot of people don't get this they assume when they start some one thing that they're going to be even average at it and we, which is which yeah. is a really yeah. naive way to be but it's understandable how all of us think like that Whereas in reality, you start any sort of hobby or craft or anything like that, and more than likely you're going to make an absolute hames of it. And then someone's going to go, you made a hames of that, and here's why. And then you're like, oh, yeah, now I know. And then you make slightly less of a hames of it. And then once you start getting to, not average, but you start getting to, to actually something, I've made something, that can fill you with a great sense of, oh, I'm getting it, I'm getting it. But it's getting people on that path that's so, so difficult. Uh, and this is a question I want to ask you is for all the makers who are listening to this or that we're talking to, what would you say 
that they need to do to get involved in blade making and get involved in the kind of the community? What tools and skills do you need to actually go from zero to winning the RDS uh, design craft show? I, I, I think um, first and foremost, humility. <laughs> because, you know, you have to embrace the idea of what you've said there of like um, taking failures and limitations and blips in your stride. And if, if you go into it thinking that you're going to be a hero from the word go, you know, you're off to a loser. That Another reason that I would use that word humility is because if you approach people that we were speaking about earlier in the podcast with a question, people can sense a motive a mile off. But if you approach them in, in a humble way and you, you know, acknowledge that, like, you know, I'm asking you because I, I have you as being more of an authority than me, and I know very little. This is my hunch. Would I be right? If not, where am I going wrong? And you've got that kind of approach about you rather than being a bit of a know-it-all. Um, you got you you'll do well if you stick at it. Whereas, like you say, you know, if, if if you if you kind of expect to be a high flyer from the word go, you won't be doing this in a couple of years. So I, I think maintaining a balanced view of your own skills, not not a self-deprecating one at the same time, but a balanced view and be humble in your approach to other people and other people's knowledge, understanding, experience. You're after a winner, like that's my opinion. I don't know what Sam thinks. Uh, I find it re- like for you and I, I still really value the fact that, like, when I'm having issues of something's gone wrong, I can message you and go, Oh my god, this has happened today, and you understand that and will rein back my horrors or will tell me of your horrors of the week. People need to understand, like, <laughs> it still happens. It, it, it happens in different yeah. ways if you progress along it. About two months ago, I had a whole bunch of blades forged out. I'd spent a week making the steel to do it. The steel worked really well. I forged the blades out. I heat treated them. And then, like, 70% of them blew apart after the heat treat. Oh, so it's just like, okay, well, that's, like, 10 days of hard graft and material like there's no going back you're not going to replace them can't use them again and i can message sam and say okay here's me (laughs) what's going on sam's like it's okay don't panic like think about this do this today this happened to me or like why don't you go away and talk to this person because that person's definitely have dealt with like whatever level you're on there is always going to be someone that's got your back that understands where you are or there's going to be somebody else that you can pick a question with and they're going to give you a bit of guidance and it's a lovely thing to know and to have that security of uh, yeah the failure is it's the biggest teacher in the world embrace it we need to understand failure and i think that's sort of the the push that i would try and give people is like just Take those knocks on the chin. Be bold, be brave, stand up and accept where things are falling to pieces. And it's not always going to be like that. You're going to have some great things come about and you're going to have a real good buzz about it. Really what about tools? Like, What are the key tools that people need if we're getting started? Uh, I'd say you and I probably started in a similar way of like a real basic. basic. Very basic. Very uh, basic. Very basic. Yeah. Like I, I, I was using files sandpaper and i was actually well this 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 almost it caused a lot of trouble in my marriage i'll put it and it was only early days of my marriage too <laughs> and it was heat treating in, in the stove in the living yeah, room yeah. I, I would not uh, get away yeah. with that done i would so not open, get away open, with that well open open stove put the blade in leave it in there for as long as i thought it was right and then don't get into chip fat in the living room that went nice. that went really well that went down really well with my messes like you know what? In fairness, she was she was so understanding, and like I'd kind of do my heat treatment days when she was in court for the day. Um, um, but but yeah, like you can see that I started with stuff that was probably fifty quid or hundred quid's worth of gear, you know. And then I built my own belt grinder for a hundred quid. I used a a, a a jacuzzi pump motor to power it. And box sections and wheels that I bought off eBay, and like that—that that was kind of the long way around. 
I should have just saved up and bought one, really. Admittedly, he learns a lot, you know. And I'd imagine Mr. Gleason came from exactly the same kind of uh, grassroots as myself. <laughs> Life on a budget. I That's think it. there's also an accessibility now of uh, more stuff available. As my final question, I want to put to you, we were talking about the workshop that Gleason is working on. And I'd love to learn a bit more about that because I think how that fits into the wider maker community, it sounds like it's going to make a bit of a splash. So tell us a bit more about yeah. it, Gleason. Well, originally it started out as an idea of just having a, a knife workshop and taking people like myself and Sam and a few other people that I've met along the way that could teach people some ins and outs of making. And we'd each take our own little pockets of what we knew and we give people some experiences. But the more we thought about it, the more we realized that this was perhaps something that we could do across the board of a, a craft sphere. So uh, it's now growing into sort of a next level maker space that is going to provide from one day workshops to high level residential uh, workshops to kind of what I've just been in the states doing we're going to be bringing in international teachers for it there will be on my level i guess i would like to be able to give somebody the gift of what fingal gave me of like here's some materials here's how to work with those materials you're going to be able to leave with a night like if you're into cooking at all being able to work with a knife that you have made yourself is a pretty amazing thing all the time like sam and i both sell to a lot of chefs and a lot of home cooks and like when i'm working in a catering event or i'm out doing a food festival or something like that and it's really nice getting to meet some of the chefs that have bought your work or all of a sudden you're watching a demo by somebody from some fancy restaurant and they're using one of your knives and you're like yeah it works it's like it's really good they're enjoying using it so on a basic level we're going to try and pitch this sort of thing on a on a mass level i would like to give people somewhere where they can come and learn where they can come and grow there'll be good quality tools to use there'll be the chance to experience other people on the journey of making and that's been probably for you and me like we both work in sheds on our own a lot of the time which is possibly why we like chatting but like it, if you can put four people in a room who are all learning this experience together it can be a really really enriching experience because each of them is going to have something they're going to be able to do better than the other and each of them is going to have something they're going to have a problem with and it's one thing myself or sam saying okay this is what i know this is how you do it but when you get to watch somebody next to you that's never done it before who you yeah. like oh how are they doing that and it's this growing each one teach one kind of aspect and i've had a couple of local lads recently who have been really interested in making the knives and they've come out for a little bit of time in the workshop and it's i kind of bounce them off of each other and i i feed them little bits and pieces and then if one's available we try out a different little bit of stuff and then when they're both there i'm like okay well i taught you that last week so you're gonna while i'm working away i'm gonna watch you explain what you learned last week and you're gonna make another one to reiterate what you learned and you're gonna explain to the other dude as to why that works and it it's been really humbling for me to realize that what i'm teaching people is effective and they're making a, a usable tool but then also it's really nice watching someone else get the buzz of passing on something they've learned and we kind of keep this rolling but we're gonna do food experiences eventually we'll have accommodation on site it it will be something pretty special i think it, there's nothing quite like this in ireland existing at the minute there's a few places around the world that do and my conversations with these people that run these sites have been pretty humbling to hear what the owners and the teachers get out of working there and i would dearly love to bring this to ireland allow this place to grow it's it's not going to be the sam gleason school of knife making 
this is going to be a, a multifaceted kind of craft school, cookery school, learning space for people to come and experience many things and hopefully leave a more enriched person. And hopefully, like, I'm all for people to come and teach me and, like, open my mind. Kind of, there's so many things I don't know. So let's get some good teachers in and uh, let's see what we can grow. And Sam, is it going to be more than just knife making? Is it going to be like broader focus on craftsmen or just on knife making? We've got a few different knife makers who are interested to come on board and teach different aspects of it. Uh, I have a really good friend who's a spoon maker here, um, Eamon O'Sullivan, Hewn Spoon Maker. Yeah, Eamon is, if you're interested in a spoon making episode, chat to a Eamon is like, Eamon's probably one of my biggest inspirations on a William Morris kind of deal, like he is the Renaissance man. And that's when I found William Morris, I was like, okay, this, I need to enrich my life. Like I, I was studying science. I was making art in all my free time. When I met Eamon, he did a very similar to degree to me, but then he plays saxophone. He's an incredible dancer. He does environmental surveys for people. He's disappeared all around the world. He's built boats and he taught himself how to make spoons. And now he's, I'd say he's probably the best spoon maker in Ireland. He's potentially one of the best spoon makers in Europe. I don't know how he would feel about me saying that. So I'm not going to sing his praises too much. His work is phenomenal his understanding of wood is astounding his use of tools is incredible he's able to teach he's able to i've watched him work with so many different people and that's been a real inspiration for me as to how he goes about that sort of process so we're really keen to bring his understanding of craft in we've got basket makers keen we have weavers keen all sorts of dye people, textiles, people, that this is a really nice broad spectrum. I want to say heritage craft skills, but I'm totally open to go. Someone wants to come and do a 3D printing workshop. I don't have a 3D printer, but if you want to bring your own 3D printer once we're set up and teach people how to use it, let's do it. Sam, that sounds absolutely incredible. Like it really, really does. And I wish you all the luck at it. Okay, guys, thank you so much for that. It's been an absolutely brilliant time talking to you. I have learned a huge amount about knives. I've learned a huge amount about the culture. And I'm really, really blown away. Do you guys have any plugs or anything you want to shout out before we go? But Dunn, if people want to find you, where will they find you? So, yeah, I'm, I'm on Instagram. I'm tiny on Facebook. But um, on Instagram, I'm Dunn Bladeworks. Dunn underscore Bladeworks. Um, but if you just do a Google search, you'd find my Instagram quite handily. And uh, my website is dumbbladeworks.com. And, you know, in general, my knives go live. I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of finishing off custom orders. My books have been closed for three years working through stuff. Um, but, yeah, I'm listing knives on a, maybe every second week on my website, dumbbladeworks.com, on Saturdays at 5 o'clock. So that's generally the story. But, you know, the best way to actually keep up to date with what's coming up when it's getting sold is to actually follow me on Instagram because I uh, leave nobody in the, in the dark as to what's going on, what's being listed. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dunn. And thank you to Sam Gleason. You've been incredible guests and it's been immensely, immensely great to talk to both of you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Very nice. All the best. Guys, that is it from us. Thank you so much for listening to that episode. And thank you so much for listening to season one. It's been such a roller coaster of a ride all the way up here to the start of season two. We covered so much in the last season. We had so many incredible makers and we have so many more makers booked in that I'm actually so excited for you to talk to them because we keep meeting these incredible people and they keep blowing me away with all this new knowledge that they're giving me. Uh, in terms of the blade makers, it is such an overlooked topic. Even though we all have knives and blades in our houses, any day we're cutting up stuff for our carrots or our meat, and we're thinking, my God, these knives are so dull. They're like no use. And then you're talking to these makers who spend hundreds of hours creating these works of art. 
it blows my mind and I'm really, I'm really tempted to get one actually. But if you want to follow either of those makers, all their information should be right down in the description. You can contact them, you can get on their wait list if you want to get one of their lives. Although I'm pretty sure their knives are like their backlogs are like a few years. Um, don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure it's pretty far out there. But if you want to get in on that or you want to get one of their custom knives, you just give them a buzz. Um, a big thank you to Vicky Toomey Lee and to Code and Grace, our sponsor. Both of them make this entire production possible. I just sit here and talk to really interesting people. They do all the editing and they pay to keep the lights on. So thank you so much to them. And we'd also really, really encourage you to please follow, like, and subscribe and share. Uh, dude, it, you have no idea how important it is for people to do that because that's how we grow and we kind of get it out there. It's really good for the YouTube algorithm. It's really good for Spotify and Apple Play. So if you can, please like, follow and share. And if you want to share it around and show other makers what we're working on, maybe an episode isn't of interest to you, but you might know someone who really, really wants to see it. And we'd really, really appreciate that. As well as that, if you know a maker or are a maker who's really into creating stuff and wants to talk about their passion, we are always looking to talk to people and we always have a spot ready to talk to the interesting makers. It really doesn't matter what you do. Uh, we've, got, we've been talking to people from all sorts of different areas, uh, not even like the stereotypical maker areas. So if you're just into something really off the wall, send us a DM and you can contact us through our website or any of our social media and you can talk to us and we can see if we can get you up on the show. We're always interested to talk to someone. And I guess on a personal note, thank you so much for all the support. Um, it's been really, really incredible just to talk to all the different makers and all the comments that we've been getting. And we've felt so much love from the maker community that we're super, super thankful. So we're looking forward to, doing a, to finishing off season two and then looking to the future. And we're really hoping to grow. We're going to be at Dublin Maker. We're going to be at Dublin Comic Con. We're going to be doing talks with some, I think some of the most interesting makers in Ireland and we're really really excited for it and we're really excited to see where it's all leading. We've started season two, we have so much more content coming and thank you so much. Follow, like and subscribe and guys I will see you in the next one. Keep making. <laughs>